On June 4, 2004, Marvin Hemeyer took his modified armored 85-ton bulldozer and plowed a path of mayhem and destruction in the small mountain town of Granby, Colorado. His rampage destroyed 13 buildings and caused more than $5 million in damages. This week, our super friend Eric will share this crazy story with us and we'll learn what inspired Hemeyer's actions, how he turned his bulldozer into the Killdozer, and what finally ended his demolition expedition on this episode of Technically a Conversation. you're listening to Technically a Conversation, a podcast where we share an interesting topic or story with each other and hope you find it interesting as well. I'm one half of your host, Jose, and I'm joined today by my lovely co-host, Isela and Elena. How are you ladies doing today? Wonderful. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Thank you. Very excited. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Isela, time for the weekly nail update. <laughs> Last week, you shared that your nail had gone from the larval stage to the chrysalis stage, has a beautiful butterfly emerge from the husk of the tattered cocoon on your index finger. Yeah, it is finally somewhat normal. Look at this. Oh, it looks normal. <laughs> it looks normal. Now, if I can, if I can only be matching and look just as normal. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah. Normal is boring. Just <laughs> don't true. be weird like uh, J.D. Vance and Trump. Oh. <laughs> normal. Yeah. Is perception also. That's right. <laughs> True. Yeah. And we appreciate you taking us along in this journey with you. Yeah. Thank you for everyone who stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> I know this was the part of the show that everybody looked forward to the most is finding out how your nail was doing. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. But like, we got to know. <laughs> How's everything going with you, Elena? Do you have a black nail to report to us as well? I have zero black nails. I have red nails, though. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that's great as well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as exciting as uh, Isela's black nail, and they have not gone through any transformations. <laughs> oh, that's a good thing. No, especially when it started, uh, it wasn't really like peeling off, but like it, it was... Uh, yeah, it was, like a, it was like a whole chunk that had just like chipped off or something. It was really, <laughs> it was really sad. Oh my God, oh, I'm falling apart, literally. <laughs> Well, if Isela and Elena are both on the show, that means that we have a special episode planned. So before we introduce our special guest, which we are very excited to have on the show, we do have to make an announcement. We will be ending our show with our Halloween episode. They say that all good things must come to an end. And while our show is mediocre at best, it too will end. There is no animosity between us or any creative differences. Honestly, I just got burned out on all the editing. So... That's why it will be ending. When Isela and I first started the podcast, we didn't think that anyone was going to listen to this shit, aside from ourselves and those that we could trick into listening to it. <laughs> Our show has been streamed close to 35,000 times. We have listeners from all over the world. We've met some amazing people in that time, people that we would have never have met had it not been for this podcast, people that I'm proud to call my friends, like our special guest today. And even the relationship between Elena and I has gotten stronger since now we have a reason to meet once a month and catch up. Also want to thank you, Elena, for stepping up when Isela needed to take a step back from the show and you volunteered to come on as a co-host. I was really worried as to what was going to happen with the show, but I feel like you were very welcomed with open arms by our amazing super friends and brought a different dynamic to the show. Yeah. So thank you. It was my pleasure and it actually uh, uh, gave me a hobby. Because I didn't have any. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> My hobbies include being mom and worker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. now I then I became podcaster. So mm -hmm. I appreciated the opportunity. I had lots of fun doing it. But, uh, you know, something else will come. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Maybe in a few months after the fog of war has lifted, be like, you know what? I really miss doing the podcasting and spending my entire weekend and uh, <laughs> evenings off from work editing. Maybe we should start this up again. <laughs> yeah. And I will probably still be available. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Also, I want to thank you for starting this journey with me, Isela. I couldn't have picked a better person to start the show with. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and everything you do. You did like 98% of the work. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. For sure. <laughs> so, yes, thank you so much for always just drilling in and making sure we're going to put stuff out on time. And everything always came out timely and great. Thank you so much. It was a big change for me to have to play the adult sometimes. That's not something that I'm used to, but uh, I think the show made me a little bit more responsible, or at least I like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> so what happens now? Our regular super friends will get the last show on October 28th. Our patrons will get the last show on October 21st. We will also record a special episode just for the patrons. You will not be charged for November, and if you are, I will refund you. Also, keep an eye on your email. I will be sending an email to the email addresses that you have on file with us because we will be giving all of you a very special gift. We'll also post something on Patreon in case you miss our email or it goes to your spam folder or whatever, because I will need to get some information from you. So thank you all so very much from the bottom of our hearts for accompanying us on this crazy journey and hope we were able to make you laugh, entertain you, and make your day just a little bit better. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Super Friends, for joining us. Someone that will be making our show a little bit better is our special guest co-host for today. Some people know him as Chef Eric. Others know him as Legacy Bricks Eric. We know him as Super Homie Super Friend OG Eric. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Woo, welcome. Welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Eric. My name is Eric. Uh, as you said, I'm Chef Eric. Uh, I have uh, lived and uh, worked in six countries. I have visited 61 countries. Uh, I've been you know, all around the world, cooking my way around the world. And now in the last, I don't know, 10 years, Lego has been one of my hobbies. So uh, as you said, Eric's Legacy Bricks is uh, what I've been doing recently. So that is uh, a little bit about me. So I'm a Lego fan and a chef, and uh, that's me. And I want to thank you for having me along this journey. And uh, I've uh, I've listened to every one of your episodes, which is why I've been, you know, I'm the OG Eric, because uh, <laughs> I, I love the podcast and I'm sad that it's ending, but uh, I'm glad to have been part of the journey. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we definitely do appreciate you. I know that you um, you normally post on every one of our posts, so <laughs> you know, that we definitely do appreciate you doing that. I do try. <laughs> yes, we do. We we always appreciate all the the engagement, and it's always like a fun and upbeat kind of comment. So I appreciate it too. Yeah. Well, I tried to dial it back because I I felt I was the only one commenting, and I didn't want to be that crazy that crazy guy. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? We all love a little crazy. Who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, after we do this episode, <laughs> your uh, other super fans might be like, "Who is that guy?" <laughs> oh. <laughs> They're just jealous. We've shouted you out ever since you became a patron. I think even before that. So yeah. I think all of our super friends will be very um, familiar with at least the name. Yeah. But now they'll be able to put a voice to the name. Yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. And you can always go back and re-comment on all the past ones. So <laughs> Sure. <laughs> all the ones you missed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Enough fucking around. Ready to get started? Ready. We ready. are ready. Great. Let's get started. So let me pass the microphone first so you can bust like a bubble. Ohio and Sunland, now you know you're in trouble. I... Take it away, Eric. <laughs> what story would you like to share with us today? All right. I want to head out to the west to uh, Colorado, and we're going to head out to Granby and talk about the Killdozer. So I want to start by asking if any of you have, uh, are you familiar with this quote? I was always willing to be reasonable until I had to be unreasonable. Sometimes reasonable men must do unreasonable things. Are any of you familiar with that quote? I am not. No, I can't say that I've heard it. Yeah, I can't say I've heard it either. Was it Tucker Carlson that said that? No, <laughs> I'm sure he would uh, say something like that. <laughs> the last part I've always heard, sometimes reasonable men must do unreasonable things, but I never thought that this 
man said it. Apparently, uh, the man who said that was Marvin Hemeyer, and he is the man whose name is synonymous with the killdozer. Marvin Hemeyer, on June 4th, 2004, unleashed his gigantic, armored, tank-like bulldozer upon the small town of Granby, Colorado. He took out 13 area buildings, including the town hall, local newspaper, and former mayor's home in an act of defiance and revenge against those who he claimed did him wrong over a decade-long property dispute. Over two hours of destruction came to an end when his overheating bulldozer became stuck in a hardware and appliance store where he took his own life, which was the only life being injured or killed that day, which resulted in over $7 million in damage throughout the town. Are any of you three familiar with this story? No, but I was going to ask if his giant bulldozer was a uh, nickname for something else. <laughs> Sorry, I'm dirty minded that way. <laughs> you know, I had never thought of it that way. <laughs> I don't think you would normally think of that stuff. <laughs> I just, it's just me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me lay you down and plow you. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I had never thought of that. <laughs> sorry. So that's the synopsis of the uh, of the killdozer. So none of you are familiar with the killdozer? I have not, but I feel like if I would have heard that, I definitely would have remembered that. <laughs> that's just nuts. And that was 20 years ago. That wasn't, it doesn't feel like that was that long ago. I was familiar with it because uh, you had shown me the little Lego thing that you had built and you told me about it. And then um, I want to say a couple of months ago, Stuff You Should Know did an episode about it. So that's how I found out about it. But I know you and I were talking about it yesterday, and you said that there were a lot of, um, not discrepancies, but there were a lot of things that they got wrong. Yes. Who's they? Stuff You Should Know. Yeah, Stuff You Should Know. Uh, there's a book, uh, which will, uh, I, I don't have the book in front of me, but uh, there's a documentary called Tread, which you can uh, watch it. I believe it's on Netflix, and you can also watch it on YouTube. The person who re uh, wrote the book was the producer of the documentary Tread, and he's very biased, and um, that person was the publisher and editor of the newspaper in town. So a lot of the sources that Stuff You Should Know got their information from this editor. There are two sources of information, Marv Hemeyer and this publisher, which uh, I can't remember his name at the moment, but uh, it, it is in my notes here. But uh, there's basically two sources, and most of the sources come from this uh, publisher. We're going to go over both of these uh, sources and see what really, really happened, because a lot of the story doesn't really line up uh, between, you know, what stuff you should know, and also Tread goes over, and what really happened. So uh, let's get into it, shall we? Definitely. Let's do it. Sounds good. We definitely like to get down to the real story of what actually happened. So that's right up our alley or right up our league or whatever sports metaphor is appropriate there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> let's plow ahead, shall we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> All right. So Marvin Hemeyer was born in South Dakota in 1951. In 1971, at age 20, he enlisted in the Air Force. Marv was stationed in Colorado in 1974 in Lowry Air Force Base, where he apparently fell in love with Colorado. At age 38, Marv left the Air Force and set up a car repair business in the Boulder area. His shop did very well. Marv wanted to take some time off and was approached by one of his shop hands, Doug Grandstetter, about leasing the business from him. In November 1991, Marv leased his business to Doug for six months, and he left for a small village of Grand Lake, Colorado, about 75 miles northwest of Denver. Grand Lake at the time had a population of only 170 people. Here, he did some hunting, but more importantly, he did a lot of snowmobiling. He joined a group called the Thursday Club, and as the name suggests, this group, sometimes a few riders and sometimes almost 50 riders, would ride through the snowy Colorado forest on Thursdays, and Marv would also modify and build what the group referred to as the Marv Bumper. 
on their snowmobiles. Stuart Spencer, a member of this Thursday club, called Marv his best friend and looked at him as an older brother. A young Matt Reed, another member of the Thursday club, was only 17 when he met Marv. Marv took him under his wing and looked up to him like a father. He said Marv taught him how to work on snowmobiles and that he always helped him and always gave. Another Thursday club member, Bruno Schroeder, stated Marv was, quote, the type of guy who would give you the shirt off his back. In May of 1992, Doug was doing really well leasing the business off of Marv and asked to renew his lease. He agreed, and Marv bought a very nice cabin in Grand Lake. So it's here we must insert some background information. During the 1980s, there was a savings and loan crisis scandal. A lot of lending companies that took care of personal loans, mortgages, car loans, business loans, went belly up and disappeared. Over a third of these companies vanished. Poof, they were gone. All across the United States, many people who had these loans didn't have a company to pay back their loan. So what did these people do who owed these loans? Were they responsible and placed that monthly owed amount in savings accounts so they could pay these loans back? No. No, they went on the run. Well, they didn't go on the run. They bought <laughs> other things that they couldn't afford. Yeah, but they just bought it as a shit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what I would do. Extra money in the budget. Yeah. 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 So like you said, these loans were never paused or closed. So months and years later, here comes the FDIC knocking on your door. Hey, you owe us money. So these people thought they were getting stuff for free, didn't have the money, and without the money... To pay for the loans that they had taken out, the FDIC foreclosed on many of these loans and many of these people filed for bankruptcy protection, herein causing the savings and loan crisis scandal. So now, back to 1992. A fellow Thursday club member, John Kleiner, discussed with Marv that he had ambitions of opening his own car garage in the area. The two found a 3,000 square foot building with three overhead bay doors making a perfect car repair building on a two-acre lot of land that was scheduled for an upcoming April auction. This lot of land was next to a concrete batch plant. And for those of you who don't know, a concrete batch plant is also known as a concrete plant and is basically a factory that combines raw materials such as sand, water, rocks, and cement, and it creates a ready-mix concrete mix, okay? It's a, a ready-mix concrete. The owner of this property went bankrupt in the 1980s following this savings and loan scandal and was now under ownership of the Resolution Trust Corporation, a holding company of various failed banks. This two-acre lot was one of those several lots for auction that day in the town of Granby. Pre-auction price of this lot was $110,000. John Kleiner and Marv had agreed to $66,000 as the amount to budget and decided to see what they could get at the auction. The agreed plan was Marv would purchase this land and then finance this land to John, and John, using part of the business profits, would then pay back Marv. The day of the auction comes, and Marv and John sit at the back of the auction. When the auction lot began, the opening bid started at $25,000. Someone towards the front immediately placed a bid of $35,000. Marv raised the bid to $37,000. The opening bidder responded with $38,000. Marv countered that bid with $42,000. But then there was no counteroffer. Marv had won the auction at $42,000. That's pretty smart. Pretty smart. I would have just gone straight to $66,000. No. That's all the money that I have. <laughs> you don't know how to auction, sir. <laughs> no. It's a good thing I took up podcasting instead of auctioning, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not giving you my credit card for eBay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> 66000 and that's my final offer. <laughs> so, sir, we started at $2. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's like the Elon Musk, I want to buy this for a billion dollars. And he beat out 
the next bid of zero dollars, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. And then the property uh, tanks <laughs> like X. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Exactly. Uh, just like Twitter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. X now, sir, X. X, yeah. <laughs> I will always call it Twitter. Yeah, I, I think everybody calls it Twitter. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I like to say Twitter, formerly known as X. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like we should call it Twitter past tense, like twatter. Like twatter. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that sounds good. <laughs> Just kidding. That's horrible. I think you'll get a different type of clientele show up than what would you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Oh no! <laughs> so it was after the auction. Right. Sorry. Go ahead, Eric. <laughs> no, you're you're good. <laughs> so it was after the auction that Marv was introduced to the person who had started the bidding on the property. The person who had initially purchased this property back in 1972 and had actually built the building they wanted to use for the car repair business, and that person's name was Cody Docheff, who due to poor money management, fell victim to the savings and loan crisis and went bankrupt in the 1980s. He lost everything. This is something that most reporting, including the documentary Tread, leaves out. According to Marv in his tapes, because he left, he didn't leave a manifesto. He recorded four cassette tapes, which he mailed to his brother before he did this rampage. So that's the recordings that uh, I'm referring to. Uh, In these tapes, Cody gave him a tongue lashing for about 10 minutes, and he called him every name under the book. And in these tapes, Marv calls Cody, quote, rude, arrogant, and an all-around fucking asshole. (laughs) Great guy. Hey, I've been called that a bunch of times, so. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) I thought you were going to say, coincidentally, Elon Musk was the person that was trying to bid (laughs) that property. (laughs) No. That'd be funny, wouldn't it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So trying to calm Cody down, Marv explained to him his plans for the property and even tried to offer him the property, as you would, Jose, for (laughs) $66,000. Excellent. Make back that money. Yeah. (laughs) But Cody didn't have $66,000. He only had $50,000, which he had secured from his friend and former Granby mayor, Gus Harris. It turns out that Cody had owned the concrete batch plant, but because of his poor money handling and lost everything, but he had friends in high places, and his concrete operation was purchased by the Thompson family, who we will get to in more in a minute, but... The Thompsons allowed Cody Docheff to keep the business operational. While at the auction, it was revealed that the EPA had an audit on the property due to an oil spill, and the cleanup cost for this spill would cost an estimated $20,000. Yeah, so now we're at the $60,000. So John, who wanted this property, told Marv he wanted no part of it. So without a legal contract, You know, this was just discussions between John and Marv. Without that legal contract, this left Marv with the property. Again, this is left out of most reporting. So I want to come back to Cody. And um, you remember how you said you had (laughs) 50,000? As a matter of fact, I've got a property here that just fell off of a truck (laughs) that I'm willing to part with for $50,000. He's still interested. (laughs) (laughs) Through the FDIC... Marv had discovered that a majority of the oil spill had been cleaned up, so it didn't cost him as much to get the property up to code with the EPA. This was during the summer of 1992, where he would come into the Granby Sanitation and Water Department Superintendent Bud Wilson. Bud Wilson notified Marv that he needed to hook into the city sewer system. Now, if you watch the movie Tread you're left with the impression that Marv had to piss in a bucket and had no running water. This isn't true. Also, the podcast Stuff You Should Know mentioned that he was dumping his sewage into the stream. Again, this wasn't true. If you remember, Cody Docheff built this building in the 70s, and he had a working septic system and a well. At the time of the construction of the building and the concrete batch plant, It was outside of the city limits, and this was totally legal. 
but because of the growth of the city, the city limits had expanded westwards, requiring businesses to hook up to the city services. Again, this is not mentioned in Tread. This is not mentioned in the book. So again, those documentaries and those sources are leaving this stuff out. Wanting to comply, Marv simply asked, what do I have to do? Bud insisted that he would take care of all the paperwork, making it basically a simple come down to the city board meeting, sign some documents, pay the city fee, and it's a done deal. But when Marv arrived for the board meeting, the paperwork wasn't completed. The board member stated he needed maintenance easements from his neighbor because the sewer hookup was not adjacent to Marv's property. Now, if you're not familiar with what a maintenance easement is, it's a former written agreement between the city and private property owners giving the city permission to install and maintain the sewer lines on private property. The closest hookup point was directly south across from Mars property. And of course, that property was owned by Gus Harrison, the man who went to the auction with Cody Docheff. Oh, that son of a bitch. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) So he had three options. Ask Gus for the easement, hook up. So that's one option. Two, hook up at another location, which he found was 500 feet away and would cost between seventy and $100,000 or continue to use the septic system. Remember, he only paid the $42,000 for the property, so he chose to continue to use the septic system. So, remember the Thompson family, the family that purchased the concrete plant for Cody to keep it operational? Well, during this time, Ron Thompson was vice president of the sanitation district. Ron was one of the leaders of the board meeting, also, that Marv had to attend. Dick Thompson... Ron's father was mayor of Granby at the time. So do you, do you see a, uh, some obstacles there? How convenient. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Friends in high places, for sure. Exactly. So how many palms are you going to have to grease here before we can get this deal done? Exactly. <laughs> so according to Marv's tapes, it appears Marv was told he had to get the easement But after this board meeting, both Gus and Ron made it almost impossible for him to get the easement. Marv was under the understanding that Bud Wilson was going to take care of everything for him, but he didn't take care of things for for Marv. In Marv's mind, the cards were appearing to be stacked against him. Now, in June of 1992, two months after the auction, Marv approached Gus and tried to get him to sell the two acres south of the property. So basically, he wanted to get Gus to sell him the property to run the sewage line. Gus offered the two acres for $17,500, but Marv had passed. Then, a year later, Marv ran into Gus and asked if the offer still stood. But Gus said, no, it's $20,000 now. Marv said, okay, I'll take it for $20,000. But every time Marv tried to finalize the deal... Gus had an excuse to back out of the deal. Marv even tried contacting Gus's wife to finalize the deal, but then just finally gave up. It finally came to light that the paperwork that Bud Wilson was having Marv sign was paperwork to get Marv's business signed up under the town of Granby's ordinances. So, when Marv left that town board meeting, he never filed paperwork to withdraw from those ordinances, meaning he was still bound by those ordinances. So as long as his business remained unconnected, his business could be fined for contempt of ordinances or even close down the business. Marv opened Mountain View Muffler in 1993. He soon gained the reputation of best welder around. And within a year, Marv had expanded his property by building a storage building which housed three 2,000-square-feet boat warehouses, each with private entrances. And soon after completion of the building, all three units were rented out. So he, he, was, he was doing pretty well. His muffler shop was doing well. He had three 2,000-square-feet rental properties. He was doing pretty well, you know, for being an outsider. Yeah, especially after all the stuff that had gone against him. Yeah, and, you know, the city is not talking to him, you know, 
two or three years later, they're not talking to him about this uh, sewer hookup. So, you know, he, he's just forgetting about it. So in 1997, Cody Docheff approaches Marv about purchasing the property again. And Cody had recently purchased the two acres south from Gus that Marv wanted to purchase. And so he's starting to get boxed in. He's starting to feel boxed in. Now, remember, in 1992, the bank valued that property that Marv bought for $110,000. And so Cody is wanting to purchase the property from Marv now. So Marv hired an appraiser who valued his property now at because he had just built that new building at $270,000. Marv met with Cody and gave him a copy of the, of the appraisal and offered him the property for 250000 You know, trying to be a nice guy, dropping 20000 off, says, okay, 250000 That's a pretty good, you know, was that six times the 42000 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. According to Marv's tapes, Cody left and never came back. But if you read the book and if you watch the documentary Tread, Cody agreed to take the $250,000, but Marv immediately raised the price to $350,000. But in reality, that never <laughs> happened. So you can see the documentary is a little, little biased. But according to the Granby Sky High News editor, Patrick Brower, okay, that's the guy's name I forgot earlier, uh, Patrick Brower. The price raise was only two years later. Now, this is the initial reporting that the price raise was only two years later after the Dochef seized a zoning change to the surrounding properties. So let me add a note here that Patrick Brower is also the author of Killdozer, the true story of the Colorado Bulldozer Rampage, which was published in 2017, and the producer of 2019 documentary Tread both of which most people get their information of the Killdozer story. Brower had repeatedly promised to do an article on Marv's shop. According to Brower, Marv was never at his shop. According to Marv, Brower never showed up. Now, I don't know about you, but if you have a successful business, but you're never at your shop, who do you believe? <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a very Donald Trump uh, always at the golf course. Yeah, it's going to run itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but somehow they agreed on free advertising for the shop, which was featured in one of the runs of the newspaper. So they did get together and, and they, uh, they did run a free ad for him. So the Dochef's idea was to build an entire new concrete plant. But neither the newly acquired piece of land that they got from Bud property or Mars property was zoned for what they had in mind. So a zoning change had to be made. The town authorized Cody to file for a PDO, or a planned overlay district, which means the town could rezone the, the small four acres without having to rezone the whole area of the town. And if you've had done any dealings with small local town zoning laws, this isn't usually how town ordinances work. But remember, the property is owned by the Thompsons, and who is the mayor of Granby? Their father. Dick Thompson. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I listen to things. <laughs> You're taking notes, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> so seeing what Cody was doing, Marv had the property reappraised with the new zoning in mind, and that is when he came up with the $350,000 figure. The Dochefs were in negotiations to purchase the two acres back from the Thompsons to have the property rezoned as well for light industrial work. With the Dochefs not wanting to put anything in writing and Marv not wanting to have the business downwind of a concrete plant, he told the Dochefs that he would fight the rezoning. Every single rezoning hearing meeting opposition was headed by Marv, but Marv wasn't the only one in Granby opposing the concrete batch plant. His opposition included excess noise, dust, traffic, and impacts to air and water quality. As the hearings progressed, more and more opposition waned, so Marv did the only thing he thought he could do to stop it. He showed up with an attorney. The board dismissed the public from the meeting, 
leaving only the board with Marv and his attorney. At the end of the meeting, it was discovered as the Dochef's plant approval was breezing through, mistakes were made through this process. Imagine that. <laughs> Nevertheless, in the fall of 2000, the Dochefs continued to proceed with the pouring of the foundations of the plant. Marv filed a lawsuit against the town of Granby in Colorado District Court. So with this lawsuit in the works, the city of Granby were still moving forward and actually changed the final public meeting of the concrete batch plant zoning approval to a preliminary meeting for the plant. Approving the preliminary plans in January of 2001 and the final zoning approval being voted in in April of 2001. With legal fees piling up for the Dochefs and the town of Granby, in June of 2001, they called Marv with a deal proclaiming if he dropped the lawsuit, they would grant him the maintenance easement to attach to the sewer. He hung up without an answer. In April of 2002, the Colorado District Court ruled in favor of the town of Granby. Those bastards. I know. <laughs> Jesus. This poor guy, I'm hoping for a win for him. <laughs> oh, it's coming. <laughs> In, oh, the... <laughs> In the summer of 2002, Marv had received a flyer promoting a heavy equipment auction in Fresno, California. So he decided to drive down and check it out. Although it is never disclosed anywhere how much Marv paid, he did win an auction for one of the bulldozers, a Komatsu D. 355A. So, I don't think any of the three of you do any uh, work on on uh, no. any heavy equipment. <laughs> okay. Any light construction? No. Right. Yeah. None of that on my spare no. time. Only on the weekends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the weekends after you do, do all your editing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. After the editing, and then I run a little food truck, and then I also have a crypto scam. I mean, a uh, oh. crypto... Uh, <laughs> Well, we'll talk about that later. See if you want to invest. Yeah, okay. crypto then, scheme. There you go. And the food truck is the uh, ground up women, right? The hamburger patties with the ground that's up. That's right. Women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Only twenty percent of the meat is human meat. Oh, only twenty percent. And it's only the ones that talk back. Well, th those are all the <laughs> yeah. ones that talk back. I want my money back. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I live on a farm, so uh, so I'm I'm pretty familiar with uh, equipment like that. So what I've done is I've got a uh, size comparison with uh, something you guys might be used to. So you guys are used to commercial coaches, right? That you either take like a Greyhound bus or a um, a city bus that uh, you can uh, get on. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so the height of this bulldozer was 13 feet or four meters. The height of a bus is also 13 feet or four meters. The width of a bus is eight feet, four inches. The width, including the track with the blade is 10 feet or three meters. Oh, wow. So it's wider than a bus. Okay. The length of a bus is 39 feet or 12 meters, the length of the, the bulldozer is 30 feet. So it's not as long, but it's about three quarters as long as a bus. God, that's really huge. Mm -hmm. It's a big wow. bulldozer. Yeah, that's a big mamma jamma. That's what she said. Uh, would this be considered like a regulation size bulldozer or is it like some special? It's heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's for quarries for moving like sandstone it's it's heavy duty it's it's not for mo for sand let's just say that it's not uh it's not your everyday bulldozer it's not for landscaping no <laughs> <laughs> the weight of a regular bus is 20 to 33,000 pounds the weight of this bulldozer was 97,000 pounds oh my gosh <laughs> Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or for our friends around the world, 44,000 kilograms. It was massive. And that was before he added the additional... Uh, the arsenal that he yes. put <laughs> <laughs> So Marv paid to have the Komatsu hauled from California to Colorado. 
and it is reported that it was delivered around 2 or 3 a.m. And Marv mentions in his tape recordings the difficulty of operating the bulldozer, mentioning many times how difficult it was to put it in gear. But he eventually got the hang of it and positioned this huge beast of a machine in the direction of the concrete batch plant. So to put this in a little bit of of, uh, perspective here, because the concrete batch plant's construction, it had closed off the main entrance to the muffler shop. So consider the main entrance was going to the west. The batch plant had closed off that main entrance. And the main street of Granby is called a Gate Avenue. Parallel to that is uh, what I would call a service street, but out west, a lot of service streets are unpaved. And when I was out in Granby in 2022, it's still unpaved. But that old road that was paved was gone because they were put in in the batch plant. So the only way that customers could get to Marv's shop was this dusty road. So that was the only road that that could get to the muffler shop. This road is called uh, Meadow Road. It was a little bit difficult to get to the muffler shop because you couldn't get to it from a gate avenue because of the construction of the uh, batch plant. So can you imagine going on this dirt road that next morning and you're seeing this huge bulldozer on your way to work (laughs) it would just be that's so scary like what is going on right (laughs) that would be just nuts yeah you're like am i asleep yeah (laughs) so how does he get exhibit to go over there to pimp his ride oh yeah (laughs) yeah that was spinning wheels or something yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah, to put the rims on there and all that shit (laughs) An aquarium for no reason in the back. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> a little beta fish in the aquarium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the intimidation factor was one reason he bought the bulldozer, but no one really knows why he bought the bulldozer. But uh, yeah, it was his money. He was do what do you want. But but uh, ironically, he did place a for sale sign in the blade of the bulldozer. So I don't know, he got a really good deal and he wanted to to resell it or what, but uh, (laughs) no one really knows why he bought it. But in November 2002, the town of Granby issued Marv a fine for $3,351, which included the fine of $100 a day for not hooking up to the sewer. And remember, Bud Wilson had Marv sign up to be part of the town's ordinances, which Marv did not know all the stuff that Bud had got him into. Mm, Man. This fine also notified Marv that he would not be able to to do business until he was hooked up to the town sewer line. So he wrote a check to the town for $3,351, and in the memo, he wrote the Cowards and Liars Department. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Ballsy. Good for him. Yeah. I can tell why you like this guy now. Yeah. (laughs) Where's the lie? Where's the lie? (laughs) So so one thing I should probably mention, I had two of my own bakeries, two towns over from me. And one of the reasons I like this guy is because I had to put up with the same bullshit this guy had to put up with. It is incredibly difficult to be the small guy in town when all these stupid rules they don't apply to the big guys but they certainly apply to the small mm-hmm. guy you know and it was I, I i i have so many incidences and examples i could give but i i don't want to rustle any more feathers than i already have but i i feel for marv and i totally agree with i of course i haven't uh turned any of my bulldozers into killdozers yet (laughs) (laughs) yet oh no yet there's still uh, time yeah (laughs) we gotta get exhibit over there to pimp your ride pimp your bulldozer (laughs) i have the beta fish so (laughs) oh there you go sweet put it in the bag (laughs) i think that's so backwards because you would think that They should know anyway that small businesses are really like the bread and butter for almost any economy. Mm -hmm. So what the heck are they, you know, they're giving all these tax breaks and letting them 
off through like these loopholes or whatever with these bigger companies. I don't know. That's kind of frustrating. I can I can only imagine how incredibly frustrating that is. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. That's why Kamala Harris wants to give a fifty thousand dollar tax credit to all the new small businesses. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Not a sponsored ad. <laughs> not approved by Kamala Harris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this ad was not approved. She's going to sue us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember exactly all the details revolving one thing, but there were two buildings I had to go to to get one thing finalized, and they, they wouldn't talk to each other. And it was like, why am I running back and forth between these two buildings, which were like two miles apart from each other? And it was like, why couldn't they talk to each other? And it was just a headache, you know? It was just... Yeah. yeah if you have to deal with these these business things, it's just... I, I understand Marv's frustration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh. So, Deb Hess had contacted Marv about the check because the written amount line was incorrect. But Marv took this incorrectly and blew it out of proportion and got upset with the bank and got upset with Deb. And uh, basically, he had wrote the wrong amount on the, the the scribble part, you know, where you have to sign the amount of the 3,000. Mm, the words part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was wrong. So he had to go back and rewrite that. And he blew out of proportion about that, which he was just at his wits end. Don't you wish you could zoom in? It was probably like three thousand fucking dollars, right? <laughs> <laughs> <It's probably bad. laughs> so he's upset about this. Marv wants to appeal the decision with the the District Court of Colorado, but his attorney advised against that. So he's upset with his attorney. Uh, he's accusing his attorney of milking him out of thousands of dollars. He feels his attorney is abandoning him. He's out several thousands of dollars in his tapes. He claims it's over $500,000 that he's out of money. So Marv uh, feels he's out of options, and Marv would eventually close Mountain View Mufflers at the end of 2002 and placed everything, including the Komatsu, up for auction. Everything would sell, with the exception of the property and the bulldozer. Interestingly enough, Marv discovered that the mammoth of the bulldozer just fit inside one of the bays in his garage. And according to his tapes, Marv took this as a sign from God that this is what he was built for, and that this is what he was meant to do. <laughs> and his dealings with Granby were not finished. Wow. So should we take a break here? <laughs> or are we doing oh, a... Yeah, yeah, we yeah. can. Wow. <laughs> this poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, jeez. Yeah, let me run the ads. Okay. Oh my God. It's so exciting. And it's so, it's so disheartening at the same time. Like, Marv's trying to do the right thing. He gets with this bud guy. He, you know, even finally talks to Cody, uh, Dochev or whatever. Oh my God. <laughs> it's so bad for this guy. Like, you don't want to condone it, but at the same time, you're like, I kind of see, I kind of get it. <laughs> right. Okay. I won't run the ads then. No. <laughs> no, you don't want to run the ads? Oh, you're, you're going to have us listen to the ads? Yeah, just like we've been doing for the past 170-some episodes. <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to spice it in or something. That's fine. That's fine. Hi, this is Dakota, host of ContraZoom Pod, where we go back and forth about film. I am obsessed with movies. I could talk about them all day. If you're like me, then you'll love my podcast. Every week we take a new topic, whether it's ranking a director's filmography, covering major film festivals, or getting way into Oscar season. While every week is different, we do have some recurring topics, like our Make Remake series looking at an original film and its remake, or our very popular A History Of program, taking an in-depth look, looking at some of the biggest companies involved in film, including Criterion, A24, and Neon. It isn't all super serious topics, though, as we always need to play catch-up with all the hottest Marvel Cinematic Universe news and general pop culture goings-on. There's something for every kind of movie lover, whether you want reviews, interviews, or in-depth conversations. ContraZoom Pod is found on all podcatcher apps, and visit ContraZoomPod.com for even more information. Hey, 
If you like all things spooky, then check out A Spooky Tales, hosted by us, Christina. And MJ, where we talk about all things spooky, paranormal stories, haunted places, myths, and legends. Listen to guests tell us their scary stories. And I hear them call me by, by my name. So I run into the kitchen to check, and there's nobody there. And I start to, like, hear... Like my closet door start to open. Oh hell no! Like, oh my god! Inside. Oh hell no! All of a sudden, for no reason, I woke up in the middle of the night. Like my eyes just snapped open, and it's that strange feeling that you have when something wakes you up. You and you don't know what has woken you up until you either see what it was or you hear whatever it was. There are new episodes every Friday. Listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts, as well as at SpookyTales.com. And we're back. We're back. And we're back. So did you guys uh, <laughs> buy any uh, Kamatsu 355As while uh, the commercials were running? Well, on our break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was actually on eBay right now uh, trying to buy one. <laughs> I backed it into my garage right now. Now we're trying to pimp it out, like you said. <laughs> you know, exhibit is kind of hard to get a hold of, man. It's surprisingly <laughs> difficult. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll just put some glow sticks, just do our own version. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So Marv uh, had closed his business and he decided to lease out the property to a trash company. And according to Marv's recordings, God had told him he wouldn't be around after the summer. So God wanted him to take the winter off. So the winter of late 2002 and early 2003, Marv took it off and continued to snowmobile with his friends and the Thursday club. And he just wanted to enjoy life and try to relax from the last 10 year debacle because he knew that God was going to bless him. And those that's according to his recordings. So in October of 2003, Marv sold his two acres of land to the trash company. And that's the company that still owns the land today. They bought the land for $400,000. And then Marv was able to back lease the land to store the Kamatsu. So yeah, $400,000, that's 10 times what uh, he paid for it. So he he made a... He originally paid. Yeah. 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 Made good for himself. Good little investment. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's worth it. Yeah. (laughs) Frustration. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so at the close of the winter, Marv set up living quarters inside the garage and began a remodeling project on the Komatsu, naming it the MK Tank, or Marv's Komatsu Tank, which we would also know later as the Komatsu. Now, I couldn't find who named it the Killdozer first or where that name came from, but a lot of people claim it derives from a 1974 made-for-TV ABC TV science fiction horror movie called The Killdozer, which was adopted from a 1944 book of the same name, which uh, is about a demon who possesses this uh, Killdozer and or this bulldozer and goes around killing people. It, you can watch this movie on uh, YouTube if you'd like. It looks pretty interesting. I haven't watched it, but uh, it, it looks pretty neat, <laughs> you know, for, for 1974, you know. There was also, maybe Jose, maybe you've listened to them. There's a rock band called Killdozer. Uh, are you familiar with them from the 80s? No, I've never heard them. No? It sounds familiar. Sounds familiar, Elena? It does sound familiar to me, but I'm not really sure if I would recognize any of their songs. Okay. okay. <laughs> never heard of them. So there are two things named Killdozer before this Killdozer. But uh, I like MK Tank, you know, because Marvin was the only person who was killed. So. Yeah. I thought you were going to say MK stood for mass killing or something. I was like, oh, please don't say it. But then you did say the only casualty was the one person. So that's good. (laughs) Yeah, it was Marv's Kamatsu tank. So this is the the, the really interesting part, which I found. Um, Marv had fortified it with half inch or 1.3 centimeter thick 
steel plates into a honeycomb box, which he would fill with three inches of concrete. So think of two plates of half inch steel with three inches of concrete. And uh, do you think he used the concrete from next door? <laughs> Probably. Wow. That's what I was going to say. Hopefully you got a good deal from it, from the guy that <laughs> was trying to buy the property. Feeling it when they're not looking. <laughs> right at midnight. Well, and plus he's a welder, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was a welder. so he... Smart. Yeah. So he also built a small port in the back of the cabin where he mounted a 50 caliber rifle. And on both sides, he built a small port for a 308 caliber semi-automatic rifle on both sides. And these ports were covered with a sliding half-inch thick steel plate. So he had a, like a... Like a little window? Yes. So he could open and, uh, and, and shoot out of if he needed to, which he did. Um, inside the cabin, he had installed floodlights so he could see... He also had three small TVs, which were wired to five surveillance cameras that he mounted around the outside of the bulldozer. And he placed those cameras inside boxes made of three inch thick plexiglass. So he put that, those, that three inch plexiglass so that you know, they couldn't shoot at it. That's how he drove and saw what he, where he was going. And also Marv had the, the sense to put air compressor nozzles in front of the plexiglass so that when he bulldozed through things, all he had to do was push a button and the air would uh, remove dust and debris from the plexiglass in front of the, the lens of the camera so he could always see. Oh, wow. That's pretty inventive. Wow. That guy really thought of everything. And then 50 cal. That's a huge, that's a huge caliber. Oh my God, that was scary. <laughs> Did he also have spinning rims and the uh, the aquarium? <laughs> no, not that we know of, not that we know of. No. <laughs> Behind the plexiglass. Yeah. <laughs> the little fish flowing around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had a little fridge and microwave so he can cook snacks. He had food for a week. He had food for a week inside the oh, shit. inside the cabin. Yeah, <laughs> he had food for a week. He did not come to play. No, yeah, he uh, he did not want to fuck around. <laughs> no, he did not want to fuck around. No. <laughs> so he had the air conditioner and he had onboard fans installed to keep him cool. So he had thought of everything. Nice. The new owner of the property, Travis Bussey had a uh, required walkthrough with his insurance company. And so Marv had covered the tank with several tarps and the insurance adjuster had asked, you know, what's going on. And Marv had made up the story about this professor wanting this cooling project and the in inspector believed it and just walked on by. And so, you know, here's this huge, massive tank <laughs> and this guy just walked on by. So, okay. <laughs> wow. Could have prevented it. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. They never questioned Marv. So they further cemented the belief that uh, this was a sign from God. You know, that this was the final confirmation to, f to seal the deal. But, you know, because the trash company was starting to, to progress, Travis had told Marv that his lease would not be extended through June of 2004. So, yeah, <laughs> the final straw. <laughs> yeah. So, just after 2 p.m. on June 4th, 2004, a thunderous boom and an ear piercing sound of metal screeching could be heard coming from the trash company. It is reported that across the two way radios <laughs> of the employees at the concrete batch plant, that an explosion had occurred. Those who looked that direction saw an enormous dark gray tank merging from one of the bays of the former muffler shop and was heading west towards <laughs> Mountain Park Concrete. As the behemoth trucked towards the concrete plant, several employees attempted to stop the bulldozer by cramming objects into the track in order to jam it, but to no effect. One of the iron rods that was thrust into the treads simply snapped in half. 
Cody Docheff immediately <laughs> knew it was Marv, believing the bulldozer to be under remote control by him up in the hills somewhere. The MK tank slammed into one of the batch plant's side buildings, flattening it in seconds. A batch plant employee handed Cody a loaded revolver and he fired several rounds at it, doing nothing. Yeah, what's a revolver going to do? <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just tickling him. Right. Might as well tickle his balls. I mean, come on. <laughs> so again, this thing is almost the size of a bus. So it's massive. And then the improvements Marv made to it would make it even larger than a bus. So this thing is, yeah. is huge. Yeah, all these reinforcements. Yes, huge. Yeah. So Google the, the Killdozer and you will see images of this. Uh, it's just fascinating to look at. Behemoth. <laughs> yes. I should probably send a picture and we can put it up on the show notes or something show notes. <laughs> <laughs> one of my bumper stickers on one of my vehicles uh says my other car is a killdozer so and it has the 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 the, oh, nice. the profile of a, of a killdozer so yeah so i i mean that's hilarious i love this guy but uh, i probably shouldn't say that too <laughs> but because he is i know right yeah. not too loud. <laughs> and actually what i'll do is uh, for the episode art, I'll actually put the killdozer in the episode art so everybody oh. can see a picture of this monstrosity. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Smart. So where was he? Cody was uh, lo- shooting at it, right? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. With a 22. <laughs> Tickling Mars balls yeah. while, <laughs> while shooting. <Woo-hoo>! <laughs> 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 He should have installed those things like the semis. Are... <laughs> it was bulldozing over everything. <laughs> that would have been cool. <laughs> so Marv opened one of the side ports and fired multiple rounds at Cody. And then uh, Cody attempted to climb on top of the cabin, but to no effect because Marv had greased the armor. So here's Cody trying to climb onto the... <laughs> Onto it, he's just <laughs> sliding off. You know, it's just he's off sliding. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's a funny picture. Yeah. What did he grease it with? Uh, just probably. I mean, that's a lot of grease. That's all Crisco. <laughs> yeah. I know. Like, what the heck? He has like a Ghostbusters freaking a slime. Yeah, a slime thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, what the hell? I could just imagine the Benny Hill music playing while he's like slipping. <laughs> He's <laughs> 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 like slipping. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so the MK tank reached the main building of the batch plant, and Marv went forwards and backwards multiple times, plowing into the building, attacking support beams along the side wall until the side wall collapsed. After giving up on his hands on approach, Cody ran for his own front end loader and tried picking up the bulldozer but it was too heavy and according to <laughs> so so you guys know what a, a front end loader is think of a bulldozer but it's more like a tractor uh and it's not meant to push dirt but to pick dirt up so it has a bucket that picks up the dirt so that's a front end loader oh okay <laughs> so it was too heavy and according to a later interview all that was on the ground was one of the tires so that's how heavy this bulldozer was and this uh, front end loader was trying to pick up you know marv's loader and three of these other tires are off the ground and some people claimed that the rear tires were four feet off of the ground so that's oh my my gosh that's that's almost as tall as i am yeah yeah there you go It was one Elena off the ground. Yes. <laughs> All the while, the Benny Hill music <laughs> st- still playing out of the speakers that the yeah. custom subs put in by exhibit in the uh, the Killdozer. <laughs> so at two fifteen, uh, fifteen minutes later, after he busted through the the old muffler shop. A call came into the Granby police from an employee at the batch plant, and then four minutes later, uh, a sheriff's deputy arrived on the scene, 
as well as a Colorado State Patrol trooper, and both started firing upon Hemeyer. Quickly, more sheriff deputies arrived, took shelter behind some concrete barriers, and began firing at the bulldozer, attempting to destroy the cameras. But obviously they were unable to penetrate the bulletproof plastic. Marv drove towards them, crushing this barrier with ease, but the officers were easily able to leave without harm. After Marv was pleased with the damage and mayhem he had caused to the concrete plant, he plowed onward to Agate Avenue, which was, like I mentioned before, the main street of Granby. Like I said, I visited Granby in 2022, and this is where the main shopping is, this is where the banks are, this is where the restaurants are, and so this is where he was on to do some damage. I like how you said that once he was pleased with the destruction that he had caused. (laughs) I like that little detail. Yeah. Chef's kiss. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he couldn't do anymore. He had done all he could. (laughs) Yeah. I'm pleased with the amount of destruction and mayhem I've created. (laughs) This shall suffice. (laughs) I mean, he couldn't do much more there, right? (laughs) So what else can he do? Yeah, for reals. Yeah. So, while he's in town, Under Sheriff Glenn Trainer found a way, I guess uh, Cody had, had uh, taken some of the grease off, because uh, Glenn Trainer found a way to climb on top of the bulldozer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, Marv had built the armor to lower down over the bulldozer, sealing him inside, creating a one-way journey. So, Trainer discovered that there was no way into this thing. So, he had shot six shots into the roof vent but there were no no results he shot several rounds into the surveillance cameras again having no effect an officer threw up a flash grenade and trainer dropped it down the bulldozer's exhaust pipe the bulldozer shook when it (laughs) exploded and white smoke started billowing out of the tank but again no serious effect So he was then forced to jump down to avoid debris as Marv was about to slam into Mountain Parks Electric. Mountain Parks Electric is where a board member, Dick Brody, had worked. So that is the reason why it is believed this building was targeted. This building had to be completely repaired, and this building is brand new, and uh, I, I was fortunate to visit this brand new building when I visited in 2002 or 22 trainer then calls to the city hall to request a reverse 911. So remember this is uh 2002 or 2004. So not everybody had cell phones, so nobody could be calling and texting everybody. So what they had was a reverse 911 where everybody got the same phone call at the same time. And it was mostly landlines. So everyone's like, you know, shelter in place, shelter in place. Following the demolition of Mountain Parks Electric, he bulldozed the next door building, Maple Street Builders. It is unclear why this building was targeted by Marv. This building was completely demolished, and when I visited, a car wash had been built here, but it was totally shut down. I'm not sure why it was shut down, maybe because of the pandemic, but I'm not sure why this building was shut down. Next, Marv headed towards Granby Town Hall which housed, at the time, the town library. So in the basement was the library, and the the ground floor was the town hall. And during the time he was heading towards the town hall, a story hour for children had recently begun. But with all the commotion going on, everyone had been safely evacuated an hour before Marv was even close to the building. After totally demolishing the building, he turned to the children's play area in the back turning the jungle gym into what was later described as spaghetti. This area has now been turned into two different buildings. The town hall and the police department are now where the original town hall once stood, and across the street facing southwest is a now now a two-story library. Marv then treaded on down to the Liberty Savings Bank, where he aimed at the corner office where he believed a woman was part of the zoning board worked. The side of the bank 
has now been rebuilt and looks the same as it did in the video footage. However, the name of this bank has now been changed. Back on Agate Avenue, heading east, Marv playfully took out several street light fixtures, traffic lights, trees, and road signs until he reached his next target, the offices of the local newspaper, the Sky High News. In a Denver Post article, I read that you could still see the imprints of the dozer in front of this building, which has totally been reconstructed, but I couldn't see any remnants of this. So I, I did look. Oh, man. <laughs> I did look for the, the treads, but uh, I couldn't Darn. see any. Yeah, I you know. You did I, your own inspection? Yes. Oh, and <laughs> let me say, let me just say, when if you should go to Granby and go to the, the visitor center, do not ask for a map of the path of destruction. They do not look <laughs> highly upon this guy. <laughs> I don't think they like that, yeah. Aww. They did not. Take kindly to me asking for <laughs> about him. They, They're like, here comes another asshole asking for this again. <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, Your best bet is to look for the uh, all the street lamps that had been playfully <laughs> knocked down by <laughs> by Marv. All the tread, yeah. <laughs> all yeah. the tread marks. <laughs> I mean, this guy got this whole town renovated, you know, and uh, they they don't like him. I don't understand <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're welcome right? That's what you <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> next he set his sights on the home of the thompson family flattening the family home of the now deceased mayor dick thompson whose elderly widow thelma was taking her afternoon nap at the time and the Thompson sons were all gone from the home, so the police were frantically calling her, trying to wake her and to evacuate her, which, although she initially thought it was a prank, they successfully reached her and were able to get her out. After flattening this building, he then hit their workplace, the Thompson and Sons excavating offices and warehouses, and then a building next door which they leased to Excel Energy. These businesses have had their buildings rebuilt. He then headed down a hill to a nearby independent propane business. This is not your normal propane tank business. Sure, they have the typical propane cylinders you see out when you drive out in the country, but imagine those cylinders, but larger, much larger. Many of these tanks contained 30,000 U.S. gallons, or 110,000 liters. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's, that's large. So it was here that Marv discovered that he had not aligned his rear port correctly with the rear excavation ripper. So the ripper is the back part of the bulldozer, which can start causing cracks in the earth to excavate better. So when he started shooting from the back, his rounds were just bouncing off the back ripper and not going anywhere. So he wasn't able to shoot the uh, propane tanks. So there's a claim that had he been successful hitting one of the propane tanks and igniting them, that this would have put a nearby senior citizen retirement home in serious danger. However, people who know anything about propane, you know you need a significantly high heat source. And a simple bullet piercing a tank would not be the significant heat source to cause the explosion. It would simply cause just a leak. But the leak causes monetary damage which could be why he was seeking just to fire at the tanks. Another reason why he was possibly causing leaks, it would cause environmental damage, and that would get the EPA involved, which could be another factor at why Marv was trying to get back at the EPA. So it, it wasn't meant to take out the Senior Citizen Center. It was just to cause more damage and get back at the EPA. Just for fun. Yeah, just for fun. Yeah, they're like, here's your 20,000 right here. Right. Yeah. Your funsies. <laughs> See those tanks just blast off into the stratosphere and shit. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. And, and end up in, in uh, Boulder somewhere. <laughs> so at this location, one of the only remaining, if not the only remaining pieces of evidence of Marv's destruction from that day can be seen here. When Marv was turning... And you can see this in the footage that can be found on YouTube. When he's turning the tank, the blade of the bulldozer hits one of the storm drains and cracks it. 
and this drain is cracked and it was still there when I visited two years ago. So that's one of the only remaining things that you can still see today in Granby from his damage, which I found was pretty neat. Oh, wow. And then after the failed attempt at the propane tank, Marv trucked up the hill back towards town, where he was met by one of the Thompsons with a scraper, which uh, was brought in because they had the excavating plant or excavation business, uh, which was brought in to stop the bulldozer. But he just simply pushed this uh, scraper to the side. And so if you're not familiar with a scraper, this is a very long piece of equipment with very big tires, and it has a blade in the middle of uh, this equipment. And so it's kind of like levels sand or it levels uh, road work when you're laying pavement. It kind of makes things smooth. So that's what a scraper is. Marv then headed back towards town. This is when his engine starts to overheat. And so you can see a cloud of white smoke surrounding the dozer, and, an, and then a trail of fluid can be seen darkening the road while Marv is trying to position the dozer heading towards Gamble's appliance store. It is apparent that Marv's vision is impaired as he slams into the wrong building. This building was the copycat copy store adjacent to Gamble's. Marv then pulls back onto a gate avenue, then drives past Gamble's, stops for several seconds, steers towards Gamble's, stopping again for several more seconds, Perhaps with the engine overheating, Marv was having some problems getting the Komatsu into gear, which he mentioned in you know, the tapes, but it, then it finally takes off and slams into the side of Gamble's Appliance. Gamble's Appliance was owned by Casey Farrell, Granby Town board member and supporter of the rezoning for the concrete batch plant. We now notice that the Thompsons, who had the scraper, has now come behind Marv in an attempt to pin him in while he's at Gamble's store. And also in the video footage, you can see another bulldozer in front of Marv trying to pin him in on both sides. Mm. But those heavy equipment vehicles weren't necessary, as unaware to Marv and many others in the town, Gamble's appliances had a basement. So the right side of the bulldozer had slipped through into the basement, causing the traction of the dozer to become immobile. With the radiator leaking fluid, the engine overheating, then the dozer stuck and immobile, a police officer reported hearing at about 4.30 p.m. a single gunshot coming from inside the tank. So it was later determined that Marv Hemeyer had taken his own life with a three fifty seven caliber handgun that he placed against the roof of his mouth, and this ended the rage of Marv Hemeyer. Oh, man. Oh, wow. That's so sad. Yeah. So not quite sure what Marv had left for them in the means of booby traps. Police used explosives to try to remove the steel plates, but after several attempts, just went all in with a plasma torch and cut through the steel and discovered an access hatch to the cabin. There, they found three handguns and enough food and water to last at least a week. Marv's body was removed at 2 a.m. on June 5th, 2004. This story was the Rage of the Nation headlines until later on June 5th, 2004, where you might remember Ronald Reagan, actor and 40th president of the United States, died at age 93, stealing the headlines. So, the aftermath, Marv's destructive rampage caused over $7 million in damages throughout the town of Granby, and although the MK tank came to be known as the Killdozer, the only one whose life was lost that day was Marv Hemeyer. His body was cremated, his ex-girlfriend Trisha and the Thursday Club took his ashes up Gravel Mountain and scattered them along his favorite snowboarding trail, snowmobiling trail. Oh, snowmobiling. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't snowboarding. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Might have taken up another hobby. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have known any difference. <laughs> yeah. One year later, the town decided that the MK tank would be dismantled and recycled so that a memorial couldn't be made or parts couldn't be taken as souvenirs. Marv had given a majority of his money or liquid assets to his father, John, 
who then willed that money to Marv's three siblings, a sister and two brothers. So John Hemeyer, his father, passed away on March 31st, 2004, before this event, therefore willing all of Marv's money to his siblings and not leaving anything for the survivors of the attack to come after. It would take eight years for the town of Granby to fully rebuild after this devastation. So what do you think? Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow that's... Was there a mass conspiracy <laughs> against Marv Hemeyer, or was it all a bunch of misunderstandings that got taken way out of hand? It feels like a lot was against him. God, that's terrible. Right. But obviously, don't take the law into your own hands, people. Like, that's, that's not the message, but damn. <laughs> right, right. So he had a full week of food and supplies in this thing. I'm just wondering, like, how long he was planning on continuing this rampage if he was still able to. There was a list in the cabin that they found with his body that had 100 locations on that list. <laughs> so he had a hit list. <laughs> yeah. So only 13 buildings were taken out and there were 100 locations still on the... Uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Very ambitious. Yeah. There was a lot of fuel inside the tank. And uh, he could have kept on going. Oh, yeah. wow. Jeez, this guy. And he would have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for those dreadful Thompson twins. <laughs> <laughs> those meddling kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Damn. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. That really is. Eight years, too. Gosh. Yeah. To fully rebuild. Everyone's like, fucking more. The impression that I got, both from your story and also from the Stuff You Should Know podcast, is that really they were fucking with him a lot and he really got to the point where he just couldn't take it anymore and he, he just said, well, you're going to fuck with me, I'm going to fuck you guys back right? and just went on this rampage. So I don't think necessarily that it was a conspiracy or anything, but I don't think that he was very well liked and that's why everybody, well, I guess they did kind of conspire <laughs> against them to, yeah. you know, to fuck him over, but or at least that's my interpretation. If you watch the documentary, because most people watch the documentary, most people don't read anymore, sadly. So most people will watch the documentary. <laughs> the documentary, the only people they interview for a positive impression of Marv were the people who snowboarded with him. And everybody else that they want an impression from him were the people on the board, the Thompsons, the Dochefs, you know, the people that didn't like him already have this negative impression of him and they automatically give him a negative impression. So I would like to see somebody talk to the people other than the good and the bad people. I would like to see his customers, you know, because obviously he was doing a good business. So I would like to see what the customers thought. I'd like to see what other people thought of him, you know, because like you said, Jose, uh, nobody liked him, but I, I, I think if he had this good business for eight years, Obviously, people did like him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I, but we don't know that, you know? True. I, I think when I said that, I, I more meant the people that were in power. Oh, right. Okay. I, I see what you say. I see what you're meaning. Like the, um, the mayor, I think the mayor was like one of the Thompson twins. And then the uh, asshole that- One of the, Tom the Thompsons. No, no. I'm, I'm just saying the Thompson twins. I think that's from Nancy Drew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just being a jerk. But yeah, but yeah the, the guy that owned that, um, that concrete- thing that he you know that he wouldn't sell the the property to yeah so i think the people that were in power the people that were in city hall they disliked them for whatever reason you know and i think that they're the ones that made life difficult for him but i'm pretty sure you know his customers and i mean he sounds like he was a cool guy you know the, the people that he probably met at bars probably liked them it was just the people that were in power didn't yeah mm-hmm he even said uh, at the beginning of the story that there was, you know, like this first 20, 30 years, it was like people that he would kind of take under his wing and show them how to weld or show them how to do stuff. Like, he sounds like he had his first 30 years of being like a really good guy. He was trying to do the right thing. Yeah, just he was a reasonable man forced to do unreasonable things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Well, we appreciate you sharing this story. Wow, I had no clue to the uh like the detail it was gonna get like i had this poor guy was really pushed around yeah mm -hmm. on youtube are his tapes are about two hours and 40 minutes and uh if you're really interested in this story listen to his tapes 
and watch the Tread documentary. It is a pretty good documentary, but again, this is uh, put together by the former editor of the Sky High News, so it's a bit slanted in the Granby position. But uh, yeah, definitely, definitely check out both sides. Yeah. Definitely will. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much, Eric, for that story. Yes. It was very interesting. And thank you for having me. I think that you were a little bit less biased than than some of the other sources out there, like you said, the movie and, and stuff you should know. So it was great to get a different take on that story. Well, thank you. Now, if you thought you were going to get away without a whiskey pick this episode, to quote Rob Halford, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> I'll make it really quick, though. This week's pick is Uncle Nearest 1856. And while my friends and I would tease that Uncle Nearest sounds like the uncle your mom would warn you never to be alone in a room with, there's actually an interesting story behind the name and Nathan Nearest Green, the person this whiskey is named after. Uncle Nearest was started by Nearest Green's great-great-granddaughter, Victoria Edie Butler. It was made using the techniques that her grandfather developed, including the Lincoln County process, which involves filtering the whiskey through 10 feet of densely packed sugar maple charcoal. If this sounds familiar to you, it's because Nearest Green showed this exact same technique to a young Jasper Newton Daniel when he taught him how to distill whiskey. Have any of you ever heard of Jasper Newton Daniel? No. Mm -mm. Maybe you might know him by the name that he commonly went by, Jack Daniel. Jess. Okay, so Nearest Green was the man that taught Jack Daniel to distill whiskey and was Ooh. Jack Daniel's master distiller. Nearest Green was born into slavery and was emancipated after the American Civil War. After teaching his distilling technique to Jack Daniel, Daniel hired Nearest as his first master distiller and was the first black master distiller on record in the United States. Due to his career with the company, he is believed to have been one of the wealthiest black Americans at the time. Some stories claim that Green was a slave of Daniel. Other stories claim that Daniel never owned slaves and spoke openly about Green's role as his mentor. I'm not sure which part of that story is correct, but I thought that I would mention both parts. Along with Nearest, Jack Daniel hired three of Green's sons, George, Eddie, and Eli. 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 Eli? <laughs> In total, seven generations of the Green family have worked for Jack Daniel Distillery. Victoria Edie Butler, Nearest's great-great-granddaughter, is the master blender for Uncle Nearest and the first known black female whiskey master blender. And a master distiller and master blender are both different titles and do different things, even though they kind of sound similar. A master distiller pretty much oversees the entire distilling process, including the recipe formation or mash bill. And a master blender takes different types of whiskeys and blends them for a particular flavor profile. In this case, Nearest is made up of four different barrels, an eight-year-old, 14-year-old, 11-year-old, and a rum Bunctious seven-year-old. Coming in at 100 proof, which is my favorite proof point, you get a rich, sweet, oaky taste with a long, smoky finish. Sadly, Uncle Nearest doesn't list any tasting notes, but it recently won second place for best of show at the 2024 North American Bourbon and Whiskey Competition, along with 1792 Full Proof. I don't know if you ladies remember tasting that one. That's part of my, my bar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one came in in first place, oh. and the Riconic by King's Family Distillery came in at third place. So Uncle Nearest came in at a very respectable second place. Yeah, nice. And I did a side by side with Jack Daniels, and the difference is night and day. Hmm. Oh. Uncle Nearest is so much better tasting. It's a little expensive at sixty-two dollars but it makes me feel good to know that I'm supporting a minority and female-owned business, and most importantly, it's delicious. Also, this bottle feels very heavy and substantial, and you could probably use this to bludgeon a home intruder to death <laughs> if, uh, if you needed to use it as a weapon. It's such a heavy bottle. You're the only ones that are going to be seeing it, but it seems very massive. Yeah. yeah. Could it stand up to a killdozer? <laughs> probably not to a killdozer, but... <laughs> oh. It'll put up its own, you know, it'll, <laughs> <laughs> it'll do some damage. There you go. That's what I meant to say. It'll do some damage. Yeah. Due to the price though, I would recommend that you try it before you buy, but it might be kind of hard to find it at a bar since it's a fairly new product. 
It's only been around since 2017. And that kind of makes me wonder where they obtained the 8, 11, and 14-year barrels from. But since it says that it was distilled and aged in Tennessee, I think that it was probably from Jack Daniels. And I think tasting as good as it does really proves the role a master blender has in creating a quality product. Because I'm not going to lie, I'm not the biggest Jack Daniel fan. But Uncle Nearest 1856, I definitely fuck with. Have either of you uh, ever tried it? No. I don't think I've even seen it. No. Well, I mean, other than this, <laughs> seeing it here. <laughs> other than now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't have it when we went, when I went over or we went over. Mm. No, I just got it this weekend. I had seen it for a while and we would always joke around about the name. But uh, when they just recently won that uh, second place in that um, that competition, I said, you know what? I've got to stop sleeping on Uncle Nearest and, and give it a shot. And I really am glad that I did. The time is now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, Eric, anything you would like to plug? Maybe your socials, a website that you might have, your YouTube channel? My website, my YouTube, and my Instagram is Eric's Legacy Bricks, E R I C S, no apostrophe. The website, Eric's Legacy Bricks.com. Obviously, Instagram at Eric's Legacy Bricks, and uh, YouTube, Eric's Legacy Bricks. Thank you. Cool. And we'll make sure to have all those in the show notes. Show notes. Show notes. Show notes. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. I was wondering if anybody was going to do something different, like show, show, show notes. Like, a, <laughs> like an air horn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the air horn. Yeah, I was wondering if somebody was going to do something different. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, thank you again for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Yes. This was fun. And especially for supporting us for all our entire journey. As soon as you jumped on, you made it known. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm here for y'all. I was like, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Love the stickers too. Oh yeah. Hmm. yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed them. We're not necessarily the Thursday club or whatever, like uh, Marv, <laughs> but you know, there could be so many other things you could be doing on your Thursday evening. Thank you for choosing to spend it with us. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. It was my pleasure. Special shout out to our super homie, super friends, Sophia, Natasha, OG Eric, <laughs> which is on the show, Angie, <laughs> Eli, 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 Madtown Charity, Katya, Victor, Christine, Josh, AI Eric, and Rebecca. If you want to be super cool and help support the show, well, actually... We're going to be ending the... Uh, I don't think you should say that. I think you should just say thank you and like, yes, I go. Yeah, good thinking. I was like, is he still plugging it in? <laughs> yeah, we're not going to pimp the Patreon anymore <laughs> since it'll be ending. Shout out to Natasha. I'm going to see her tomorrow. Woohoo! Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So thank you everybody for being our patron. We're not going to pimp all the cool stuff that you could have gotten had you chosen to be a patron earlier. <laughs> Missed opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and on that high note we hope that you enjoyed the show and you join us again next week if you're enjoying the show leave us a review tell a friend and subscribe wherever fine podcasts are sold yeah while you can follow us on the socials at greetings tac email us at greetings tac at gmail.com or, or leave us a voicemail at 915-317-6669. If you have a story of when you bulldozed over... <laughs> over your neighbor's <laughs> property. <laughs> over how satisfied you were with the destruction and mayhem that you caused in your neighborhood. Satisfied, when yeah. you <laughs> Pleased. Pleased. When you bulldozed over your entire town to share with us. Frank the tank. Frank the tank. <laughs> <laughs>